Welcome back, Pokemon trainers, to the Utrecht Special Event 2023, where I'm joined by Jamie Boyd. We've had quite a morning so far, haven't we, Jamie? Yeah, absolutely. We've even been able to feature a world champion within the first <laughs> three rounds of this tournament. Uh, absolutely fantastic matches coming out so far, and some great players to show for it as well. Mm, absolutely, Eduardo Davide Correa. We've had uh, we've had the Dutch uh, top uh, top Dutch player so far as well, um, and that's only three rounds in. We have so many more rounds to come, and uh, shortly we'll be able to get into round four to see uh, what's coming up next. But uh, in the meantime, why don't we take a look back at uh, previous regional uh, events and talk about where the meta is currently? Yeah, absolutely. So. We've had, what, three regional tournaments between now and, um, and Bochum previously. Mm. Uh, the first one, I believe, was the Perth Regional Championships uh, over in Australia. And we did actually see Taran Birdie mm. flying all the way from Europe as well, from the UK, and taking that championship for himself. Absolutely incredible achievement under any circumstances, but when you're that jet lagged, I mean, <laughs> I, I take my hat off to him. And we can see his team there with that uh, great task Mousehold, Torkoal, Iron Bundle, Fluttermane, and Dragonite. And uh, looking across these teams here, seeing a few great tasks, seeing a few, uh, seeing a couple of Mouseholds. Uh, it's interesting to see that Garganackle for uh, Sam Pandelis there. Yeah, Garganackle had a really strong performance in the very first regional, and then it seemed to just take a tiny bit of a back seat going into, into future tournaments. It's still very prevalent, like in the fact that it can just spam those salt cures and be very, very annoying at chipping away everything. But yeah, it's not showing up as much as it seemed to have been implied by that first win that it took in the first regional. Absolutely, it's uh, it's Pokemon that's it's surprisingly versatile given it's a rock type. But there you go, that shows the power of terrestrializing and being able to change that type. We also see uh, one scream tail here from Alistair Sandover, the uh, second place position. Uh, one which, of course, I, I was expecting to see slightly more because of Wolf using it to win the uh, Orlando Regional Championships. Yeah, absolutely, that was uh, a very hard to perish team, let's say. Mm. Uh, so still definitely could have had access to it here, but there's no Gothitelle. So mm. if you are going with a Parasong strategy with either the, the Screamtail or the, the Fluttermane, you really want to be trapping them in. We see the choice specs on the Fluttermane there that almost certainly does not have access to Parasong. Screamtail very much still might. I think it was a like a Thunder Wave and support uh, Screamtail going into that tournament, but still a very, very good showing for it there. We can see some very, very unique picks. Like mm. we were mentioning in that previous round, uh, when we were on previously, that unique, pi unique picks are the way to go uh, for very interesting teams. And there's still some, some really cool picks here. The floor just catches my eye, definitely from Diego Ferreira there. That's exactly what I was going to talk about next. Yeah, uh, Florge is a, a Pokemon I haven't seen at all uh, in any regulation so far. Uh, and it's fantastic to see a Pokemon um, that you re so rarely see utilized so well to come fifth in the Perth Regional Championships. It's the mark of a really high quality player, I think, to be able to uh, find each Pokemon's niche. Yeah, absolutely. And another really cool pick, the Ferrograph over from Philippe Brigue there. Mm. Uh, a Pokemon that may come into the fore a little bit more as we go into Regulation C as well. That Armor Tail is a very, very cool ability, stopping all of the priority that can come out. And priority is going to very slightly pick up as we go into Regulation C. We're going to get Sucker Punches coming out from the Gym Pals. We're going to get the Extreme Speeds coming out from the Dragonites even more than they have been previously because that's going to pair so well with it as well. But still, in Regulation B, still a very strong showing here. Very strong showing indeed. I, Just from a sort of a Pokemon lore perspective, I don't really understand why Armor Tail on a Frigoroth would affect your ally as well. That's very much only covering the head of the uh, Frigoroth. <laughs> but uh, I'm not complaining. That's an absolutely, absolutely fantastic ability and one that that can guarantee some trick rooms, for example, or any other support that Frigoroth might want to go for. Um, so yeah, it's uh, fantastic to have this uh, overview of Perth again, and Taron Birdie is here today. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, as far as I know, he was he was doing well in the first couple of rounds. Mm. We'll have to see if that is still going to continue to be the case, but already coming off a regional championship win from his previous tournament, uh, very, very good. And we saw uh, also on the championship leaderboard in Europe, he's in first place at the moment. Ah, uh, yeah, absolutely. He's in first place by quite a margin. He's 100 championship points ahead. Now let's take a look at the Natal regionals, the uh, next uh, regional event that we had. Uh, that was won, of course, by Gabriel Agati uh, with his King Gambit and Moongus Arcanine. Garchomp, Fluttermane, and Dragonite. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and uh, um, I, Gabriel was saying how much better Garchomp is than Great Tusk, I think, going into this tournament. And <laughs> 
seems like he proved it, in, in, at least in his case, being mm. able to take it uh, over any of the other Great Tusks and just having a quick scan. And I can only see one of them. So, mm. yeah, Garchomp matching Great Tusk one for one there in that top cut and mm. able to take the championships as well. Yeah, what is Brazil's problem with Great Tusk? Maybe it's just because Gabriel is such a good advocate for the Garchomp. And rocking that uh, choice band as well. That is absolutely a fearsome choice. It's cool to see Garchomp coming back into the meta a little bit after uh, Regulation A, where we saw it more frequently. Of course, if you're not allowed legendaries, the next best option will be a pseudo legendary. So uh, Garchomp um, coming to the fore there, as well as a Dragonite, double Dragon on Gabriel's mm -hmm. team. I'm uh, scanning through for some unique picks. It's cool to see Tyranitar on Tiago Correa's team uh, bringing the sand, a slightly sort of anti-meta pick because uh, it, in a meta that's increasingly dominated by Torkoal setting up the sun, why not change the weather to something else? Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be very good at counteracting the opposing weather. It also does it get really well against th things like Ndidi, Armour Rouge. Uh, mm. Tyranitar matches up very well, very well against them. Uh, it's interesting to see the combination of both Gastrodon and Palafin. Uh, it seems like you don't really want to be storm draining away your attacks <laughs> from your own Palafin. So a uh, very unique combination going forward there. Uh, but it is the pink Gastrodon, unfortunately. The, not quite the correct Gastrodon, in my opinion. Yeah, maybe that could have pushed Tiago over the edge. Maybe he Absolutely. could have taken the championships if he'd been rocking the blue one. And uh, yeah, it could be a surprise tech to uh, just storm drain <laughs> your Gastrodon up to max special attack and then absolutely wreak havoc. My eyes also drawn to uh, number 16, Luciano Bago, with that uh, droopy form Tatsugiri, uh, boosting the defense, I believe, of the Don Dozo, which uh, it's been it's been interesting to see players experiment with different forms of Tatsugiri other than the curly one that uh, boosts your attack stat. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes you don't even need to run order up, so it doesn't actually mm. end up mattering too much which Tatsugiri form you do uh, end up bringing. Because if you're not running order up, it doesn't really matter. Mm. Choose whichever one is your favorite. Maybe the droopy one is just going to be the favorite there, and you're just going to be able to do whatever you want. Or if you are ordering up, then you are going to get that defense boost. And then you are able to make use of something like a body press that mm. can come out from the Dondozo as well. So uh, that can be a very, very potent combination. And Luciano sneaking in that second great tusk that I did initially miss. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's always, more, always more great tusk than you expect. Um, it's cool to see a Sandy Shocks here as well. Yeah. Uh, a Bugmon that uh, we saw utilized to really good effect in the game that we cast previously. Um, and it's just interesting to see players experimenting with all the different Paradox Pokemon at their disposal. Mm -hmm. All of them, except for a couple, and I'm still <laughs> waiting. I won't go on about it because I've done it already, but yes. Yeah, some very very cool picks coming out from Natal. There was one more tournament that we had after this one, or just before the special event. We did have the Vancouver Regional Championships. We can see the winner there, Abdullah Mahayuddin, running that Lilicol. Yeah. Uh, the meta pick that seemed to catch everyone off guard. Mm. A meta pick that caught everyone off guard, even though it's it's a tried and tested uh, formula for uh, powerful initial damage output. And uh, watching his finals match at uh, Vancouver, it was incredibly decisive. And uh, it, it, he left his opponent, uh, Ryan Aceto, in uh, a bit of a pickle. It was something that uh, Ryan struggled to um, put up a fight against. But given the Pokemon he had on his team, he did a really admirable job. Yeah, absolutely. There's some combinations of Pokemon that that you need an answer for. And if you don't, you are likely to be steamrolled. We've seen that in the Dondozo Tatsugiris. We've seen it in DD Armor Rouge. We've seen it now in Litigant Torkoal once again, coming back, getting those after your options, and really just doing whatever you want uh, on that turn, especially just the fact that you can still go for after you into other Pokemon. We saw mm. Abdullah make use of after you into the choice spec plot to main to outspeed things like Iron, Iron Bundles. Mm. So that speed control isn't limited to Torkoal. So long as you've got the sun up, Lilligant is a speed control partner for any Pokemon that's on the field. It's such an interesting move. And uh, my eye now is drawn here, Jamie, to number three. We were talking earlier about what the new Incineroar is in the format. <laughs> we settled on Arcanine, but Dylan here was rocking the uh, the choice B that we came up with, which was uh, the Paldean Taurus Blaze Breed. Yes, choice B for Blaze Breed. So, <laughs> yes, going to be going to be an another alternative to the Fire Type Intimidator. Uh, the main reason you'd be wanting to use the Taurus is that offensive coverage. You get to go for Flare Blitz and Close Combat. You do get to go for Coast Combat with Arcanine, but it's not got the same type of attack bonus as the Taurus does. You also get to make use of the Mirror Herb as well, a little bit better with the Taurus, because you still want to be acti activating the Defiance on opposing Pokemon like Annihilate and King Gambit, steal those boosts for yourself, mm -hmm. and then you want extra coverage to be able to make use of that, of those uh, plus two attacks, so you can get the extra damage and the extra coverage. So use there uh, instead of the Arcanine. Also rocking the Backscalibur. Definitely mm. the best Pokemon of Generation 9. Oh, Batscalibur is an absolutely great choice. I love a Dragon Ice dual type. Um, it, I remember back at, uh, at Around the World Championships when the Mirror Herb was revealed to be a new item in Generation 9. Um, 
how everyone sort of went crazy for it. And I'm surprised for that reason that we haven't seen more of them being rocks. It's a very positional thing. Uh, it's um, it, You can't always guarantee the success of it, but in the right positions. And clearly, Dylan coming third in uh, the Vancouver Regionals, showing that it can be used to great effect. Yeah, you tend to think of Mirror Herb, oh, I will steal the Dondozo's boosts <laughs> that the Tatsugiri is giving it. But it does have many other uses as well. There's the, the obvious one with the Taurus and the Intimidators, where you activate Defiance, they get plus one, but you get plus two. Mm -hmm. There's going to be simple things just like Indeedy activating its Psychic Seed. Suddenly you have a special defense boost as well, and you can take on Indeedy Armor Rouge way better than you would have been able to. So there are a lot of small, small things that Mirror Herb can do to come into play for you for sure. Mm. Uh, let's take a look now at the uh, most popular Pokemon from Vancouver Regionals. Just shy of 50% usage across teams, it's Fluttermane, followed by Iron Bundle, Iron Hands, Great Tusk. Perhaps it's no surprise that the top four Pokemon are all paradoxes that we, was, that we saw introduced in this format. And uh, other than that, it's that Roaring Moon and the Brute Bonnet. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, really, really strong showing for the Paradox Pokemon here. Not quite the 50%, but at least it's no longer in the 70s for the most used Pokemon uh, that we do have across the team. So a uh, little, little bit calmer than it was in the previous generations, but still showing how strong these Paradox Pokemon can be. Yeah, Fl Fluttermane, not a surprise that it's in the top spot at all. Absolutely not. And uh, looking at the bottom row there, my favorite Gen 9 Pokemon, Mousel versus uh, Jamie's favorite Gen 9 Pokemon, <laughs> as we just learned, Baxcalibur, facing off against each other there. Um, you can't underestimate those cute mice. They can either pack a punch or provide valuable support. Yeah, we haven't been seeing them pack a punch too often at this no. point. Lots of players are tending towards the friend guard, but everyone does forget, technician boosted population bomb, that does some serious damage, especially mm. when you get the wide lens, so you get almost certainly every single hit going to be connecting. That can do a lot of damage. I'm, just, I'm just waiting for Chienpao to come back so that you can get some, some sort of ruined population oh. bombs off. My goodness, that Snow Leopard combined with, com combined with these little mice, that's, uh, that's going to be absolute carnage. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's so cool as well to see an item like Wide Lens, which we rarely see in uh, VGC with much good usage, being put to excellent effect on the mouse hold. A uh, population bomb can hit 10 times, but the accuracy isn't 100%, so that Wide Lens enables you to, uh, to do as much as you possibly can to guarantee those 10 hits. Yeah, but like, getting all 10 hits when you've got a Wide Lens is about the same as a Draco Meteor. Mm. So so it, it's most likely going to hit mo all, all 10 times. And even if not, it, you're going to get most of the hits regardless. Yeah. So yeah, can be a very, very strong Pokemon for sure. Especially even if it's just going for the Frank Guards. Mm. We've seen a lot of trainers opt for Frank Guards, so that must be very effective given the fact that we're not seeing the Technician population bar. Exactly. Um, and my eye also is drawn to, uh, in fact, Torkoal as a weather setter is not the most popular. It's, it seems, in fact, to be the Tyranitar setting up the yeah. sand, and behind the Torkoal is Pelipper setting up the rain. So really interesting to see that even though it's the sun that activates the past Paradox Pokemon's Protosynthesis ability, Torkoal is not, in fact, the most used weather setter. Yeah, well, Tyranitar pairs up very well against certain Pokemon. Torkoal is just going to be generally good against most things, but Tyranitar is there to counter specific things. Like, the main thing is Indeedy Armourage. Mm. You can see that Armourage and Indeedy are all also above the Tyranitar in terms of usage. So if you have a Pokemon that does counter, the, counter those Pokemon very, very effectively, I might say, because Tyranitar resists the armor cannon, it's immune to the expanding force. Yeah. Very, very free for the Tyranitar. Yeah, and Indeedy Armor Rouge is, uh, is a combination that um, I don't think I've ever seen an Armor Rouge without an Indeedy. It's, uh, it's a core that has dominated. In fact, since Regulation A, we were talking about how some Pokemon after Regulation A, such as Meowskarada, really dropped off in usage. But uh, Indeedy Female and Armor Rouge has really kept up. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks going to be something to keep an eye on going into Regulation C, given yeah. the fact that we're going to get four Dark Types introduced, yeah. four very strong Dark Types yeah. that are going to be immune to Expanding Force, the main thing that Armourouge would want to be going for. Mm. There might be in, need to be an adaptation from Armourouge. Maybe we'll be seeing a lot more Aura Spheres on uh, Armourouge. Yeah. Maybe it'll drop off completely because you don't want to be going for Expanding Force into the Dark Types, therefore you don't really want to be using Armourouge anymore. It's going to be something to keep an eye on as we go into the next format. 100%. It's, uh, it'll be interesting as well to see, given that the four new Pokemon being introduced for Regulation C are all part Dark type, whether any other Dark type Pokemon will be used as well, or whether that will be overkill, because obviously people will be building around those four Dark type Pokemon. Uh, potentially, it makes you a little bit to uh, eggs in one basket if you introduce other Dark type Pokemon on there as well. Yeah. So we've seen the, the Pokemon like we were just mentioning, Tyranitar. Is that mm. going to still stick around? Because weather's still good. Even regardless of your typing, rather still good. Yep. King Gambit, is that going to still be sticking around? Because Defiant is great. 
like Dark Steel is a very, very strong typing. The Sucker Punch priority is going to be really nice as well. So yeah, yeah. What is going to happen to all the all the other Dark types? Are we going to just have the ruined Pokemon? Are we going to have Pokemon that aren't Dark and then turn into it? Yeah. Or are we going to st still see some of the strong Dark types at the moment still sticking in? Yeah, yeah. And King Gambit is another one of those Pokemon that sort of stood the test of time between Regulation A and Regulation B. And uh, talking about whether Torkoal is, of course, a Pokemon that sets up the sun, and we have Chi Yu that is a, a, a treasure of ruin that plenty of people are talking about in terms of a big threat. And uh, com uh, combined with the sun, it being a fire-dark combination type, mm -hmm. that could do some serious damage. Yeah, we've, seen, we've seen a fire-dark combination be pretty effective in VGC previously. So I, I can't wasn't... think of what that would be. Yeah, no, neither can I. I think Chi Yu is going to be the first first good fire-dark type in yeah. that we're going to see in, in, in VGC. But yeah, it, it's really, really strong. Mm. If, if you combine it with the Beads of Ruin ability that drops the special defense of all the opposing Pokemon, and then if you give it a boosting item like a Life Orb or a Choice Specs, and then you put it in the sun, mm. and then you tear it into a fire type, yeah. it's pretty strong. Absolutely. That's a lot of damage. It's, it's a, lot, a of damage. lot of damage. And access to Heat Wave, I yep. believe, which uh, it, there's, no, there's no escaping that unless you have Wide Guard. Maybe we'll see Wide Guard rise up in usage as well. Yeah, yeah, most most likely. We've, yeah. we've still got spread moves going going about in this format as oh, well. Yeah. You've got Make It Rains, you've got Earthquakes, Rock Slides, and all that. So Wide Guard is still a good move. Mm. I think you only really see it on maybe Garganackles and Pelipers at the moment. Mm. Uh, Armor Rouge will occasionally run White Guards, but yeah, White, White Guard is still going to be very effective mm. at putting a stop to the Heat Wave. But then you've got to contend with just a Sun Boosted Overheat instead. <laughs> yeah, you can't win. Uh, another very popular spread move, of course, is Make It Rain from Golden Go, mm -hmm. which uh, is resisted by Chi Yu. Oh dear, Jamie. Yeah. We have another Fire Dark Pokemon that's just waiting in the wings. Yeah, absolutely. And even, even Ting Lu as well reduces the special attack. Yeah. So even though it doesn't resist, might as well. Yeah. It's still going to take uh, re not, not so much damage as well. And then you're going to respond back with either your ground or dark type attacks to be able to take on the Golden Go. Even just the fact that they're dark typing. Mm. You're going to be able to hit the Ghost type Golden Go very effectively. So Maker Rain still going to be very good in the format. Mm. But is it going to be as good? That's the question. You heard it here first. We'll have to keep our eye on Make It Rain going into Regulation C. But what a what a bevy of tournaments we've already had. What a bevy of regional championships. It seems to me like Scarlet and Violet have still only just come out. And we're, here we are with so many tournaments in. So many players asserting themselves with their CP. And um, it's it's the meta is constantly evolving. And it's always a good time to join in. Especially as we have Regulation C uh, starting at the end, well, at the beginning of April. Yeah, absolutely. And, and speaking of the tournaments, there is the, there was the Ty Taiwan Regional Championship yes. that was uh, just going on as well. And we do actually know what was able to win that. It was Yang Dawei who was able to take it with Iron Bundle, Fluttermane, Talonflame, Tyranitar, Great Tusk, and Sandy Shots. So mm. very, very cool team coming up there. We mentioned that Tyranitar is still a very good Pokemon, yeah. even though uh, the Dark typing might fall, make it fall off a little bit, but still very strong in this Regulation B. Yeah. And the Sandy Shocks as well, even without the, the partner as Bathra, yeah. very strong showing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Sandy Shocks, uh, if you find the right niche, then uh, it can pay dividends. Um, we now know, though, I believe, that uh, uh, we have our round four match for you. We were just talking about Taron Verdi, the winner mm -hmm. of the Perth Regionals, and we're about to see him play against Chuzo Montero. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, we're going to be able to see the top NCP at the moment, most recent regional champion, well, very recent regional champion from, from Taron Birdie uh, going up against his opponent in Chuso. So it's going to be a really, really strong match here. A fantastic match indeed. We'll see if uh, Taron can capitalize on the momentum he's built up from Perth uh, coming into this tournament. I saw him around earlier. He seemed fairly calm. He's, he's already, as we were saying, doing very well for championship points. So uh, perhaps taking that pressure off himself, that will benefit him going into this game. Yeah, absolutely. But you still want to be pushing for that day two if you're in first place. Keep that momentum going yeah. as, well, as well as you can because then the more championship points you accumulate, the more comfortable you're going to feel in the fact, yes, I am going to get this day two invite to the World Championships in Yokohama. But yeah, we can now see the players on your screen there. Tarrant on the left, uh, who was able to win that Perth Regional Championships. Whether he's going to be running the same team or switch it up, as a, like to see if there's something that may have been slightly better in the meta, uh, that will be very interesting to see there. You can see he it did win the Perth Regional Championships, uh, but some other very good accomplishments behind him as well. Got top eight in the North American International Championships and top 16 in the European International National Championships back last year. And Liverpool Regionals top eight as well. A very recent accomplishments as well. Chuzo, 
Oh, no, a player. And, uh, you know, perhaps he'll be feeling the pressure coming to this match against Taran, but it's all a learning experience and it's all fun. And to be honest, if uh, Chuzo, even though he doesn't have any uh, achievements on the screen under his belt, still to have gone 3-0 and so far in this tournament, that's an achievement. Yeah, I think the key thing is doesn't have achievements yet. No. And we've seen already two new players, two regionals, winning their first tournament, getting the, ma the massive results. So absolutely can happen to any of these players, and it could be very much Chuso uh, in this round as well. So yeah, two very, very strong po po players coming out here already at 3-0. You want to be able to keep that momentum going for sure. Absolutely, and uh, as we saw in uh, in previous games today, it can just be all down to matchup uh, bars in uh, a match that we streamed earlier. He uh, didn't quite have the resources against his opponent's team. So, you know, if it's not the right team for Taran going in, then uh, they, no matter that he won the Perth Regionals, um, it could turn out in a very different way indeed. But uh, I have no doubt that Chuzo is going to learn a, map, a, a lot from this match either way. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to see if Taran is going to still be running that same team because it's already proven to be successful. Then mm. would you need to change it? Apparently, yes. So that is not <laughs> going to be the team that uh, Taran was able to win previously. Uh, has shaken it up here. Uh, has gone with some of the really cool picks in that Assault West Glamora that is picking up with the Mortal Spin as well. Uh, still going to ro be rocking that water typing, so going to be able to take on the steel uh, a lot better. But it actually looks quite similar to what Bass was running previously on that round two. It does, absolutely, and we, we see another Mousehold there. Mousehold was a Pokemon that uh, Taran used in uh, the Perth Regionals. Uh, so clearly he uh, has the friend guard ability, and clearly he is guarding his friend in the Mousehold. Uh, safety goggles on that Mousehold, so uh, any spores, powder moves won't be affecting that. Uh, and it's a Leftovers on the Dragonite a, uh, with the multi-scale ability, so a really bulky set. Yeah, absolutely. Leftovers is a very cool item to be having for sure. But yeah, the safety goggles you mentioned previously on the mouse holds. Uh, you are facing down a Pokemon that can be going for the spores in that Brute Bonnet coming out here. Very cool move on the Brute Bonnet, Stomping Tantrum. Mm. Move you don't see very often at all. You, like Bullet Seed, Spore, and Sucker Punch definitely makes sense, especially paired with the loaded dice, so you can get the guaranteed four or five hits. The Stomping Tantrum, very, very good coverage coming out for the Brute Bonnet here. Absolutely, and we see this call that we were talking about before, Armour Rouge and Indeedee. Perhaps it's last hurrah for a while as we enter into Regulation C, and we'll see how well uh, Chuzo can pilot this team, uh, can pilot this uh, infamous core. And we have, uh, as well as the Brute Bonnet, we have the Roaring Moon, which is a Paradox Pokemon that's not seen half as often as things like the Fluttermane, but uh, a Pokemon that has been picking up recently. Yeah, and it seems like both players are opting to bulk out their dragons a bit here. We've got Dragonite holding the leftovers for Taran, and we've got the Citrus Berry on the Roaring Moon as well, so uh, going to be bulking them out for sure. And the Roaring Moon's not going to be that uh, acrobatic set, going to be opting for a bit more support. You still got the Tailwinds, which uh, Roaring Moons do tend to, to carry a lot of the time, but going for Jaw Lock and Breaking Swipe here. So definitely going to be a bit more supportive. Uh, still going to be able to do some significant damage, mm. but not quite as much damage as the Booster Energy ac Acrobatics would have done. <laughs> That's right, yeah. It's, uh, it's uh, Roaring Moon is a very versatile Pokemon. You can run it in uh, all sorts of ways. Uh, and uh, yes, with that Breaking Swipe, yes, that is a damaging move, but also, of course, it reduces the physical attack stat of both of your opponent's Pokemon, which, looking at uh, looking at Taran's team, you know, he has that great task and he has that, uh, that Dragonite, but, uh, in fact, the rest of his Pokemon seem to index more on those special attacks. Yeah, it does seem like it is, and it looks like we are ready to jump into this game here. Uh, it's going to be Indeedee and Roaring Moon paired up with Dragonite and Glamora, so uh, we're going to be seeing this on Taran's side with the Dragonite and the Glamora. Uh, we're not going to be wanting to face down uh, that Indeedee too much, but it is going to be actually the, the Dazzling Gleam rather than the Psychic, so we're going to be able to take on that quite a lot better. You're still going to get the Psychic Seed activating, so Glamora won't be doing as much damage. There's not too much stopping a Mortal Spin here if you do want to be going for it. You can get the Breaking Swipe onto the Dragonite and start reducing that, but Mortal Spin is pretty uncontested here. You can get the Poison and you can start to chip away at the opponents, and if you, the only response is just Breaking Swipes, I'll do okay damage to the Dragonites, but it will only do chip damage to the Gamora as well, and will activate the Toxic Debris. So you do need to be very careful with this Roaring Moon here. So if you want to be starting to do damage, that damage really has to come at the cost of the Toxic Spikes. It really does, and uh, Glimora is asserting itself as a sort of hot potato in the meta. No one wants to deal with it, but uh, you know, you touch it and you get those Toxic Spikes. But in fact, we see Taran switching out his Dragonite, not feeling safe, in favor of the Mousehold, which uh, is going to give an immediate uh, friend guard boost to Glimora, as indeed he goes for a follow me, redirecting any attacks towards itself rather than that Roaring Moon. Uh, Breaking Swipe comes out from Roaring Moon, uh, does a good deal of chip damage, but reduces 
uses the attack of the mouse hold and the Glimora. Not so crucial given it's a supportive mouse hold, but here we see the toxic debris coming out from Glimora, laying a layer of toxic spikes down and mortal spin, so even these Pokemon are not going to be safe from the poison. Yeah, it looks like everything is going to be taking a poison at this point. The two on the field, following does not help with the Wartal Spin, is going to be able to connect with both Pokemon here and going to start chipping away at that Roaring Moon and the Indeedy. And it looks like Chuso did opt for the damage, which meant that was the, that the cost of, of the Toxic Debris. Now whatever Pokemon is waiting in the back will also take that poison condition. Now you can just start to slowly whittle away at the opponents. There's still not much damage coming out. It would be Dazzling Gleam from the Indeedy, not going to be doing much damage at all, especially with an Assault West Glamora. You can still go for another Breaking Swipe, to do some okay damage again that would activate a second layer of toxic debris and that would get the toxic onto the pokemon in the back and that would start to rack up even faster and then you've just got to contend with the fact that actually gamora even though it usually is tended to run more, more supportive here and just get those mortal spins off it can still do some significant damage itself if you just want to go on the offensive with some with some fudge bombs that will still do significant damage to either pokemon it really would. Uh, it's so cool to see that Glamora, even in a matchup that doesn't include Don Dozo, which is uh, sort of the Pokemon that necessitated its use to start chipping away, is still seeing use. Meanwhile, we see Chuso switching out here the NDD for the Armor Rouge, two Pokemon that normally love to be run together. Uh, and Armor Rouge, of course, takes that poison from the layer of Toxic Spikes. Mousehold, keeping itself safe, uh, won't be taking any damage this turn. Uh, as we see the Tailwind coming out from the Roaring Moon, so that will give a speed boost to the Pokemon on Chuso side of the field but power gem can come out from the glamora into the armor it's a super oh. effective hit and it brings it down to very low health but of course this is where the poison status condition comes into its own because this will be enough to pick up the armor rouge and that's a ko yeah that's a really really strong play for taran there that could have been a very very good position for chuso because if you've got the Tailwinds, now your Armourish is definitely faster than the Glamora and the Mousehold, you get to launch off an Expanding Force. There's going to be almost nothing to contest that, but now it's gone. That Toxic Debris was set up and allowed that extra little bit of damage necessary to KO that Armourish. So it would have been able to be able to survive the Power Jam, as we saw, but not able to launch off any Expanding Forces anymore. So the, uh, the choice of going for the Breaking Swipe on that first turn would have been really nice into the Dragonite but it did switch out, so it didn't actually matter in terms of I will get the attack drop on the Pokemon, and then that Toxic Debris was set, that meant Armor Rouge was taken care of. Now that we just have to see what other Pokemon is waiting in the back, back for Chuso, because if it's just still the Indeedee coming in, there still wouldn't be much offense. But Flutter, in Fluttermane would definitely be the offense, though. Yeah, in fact, it is the Fluttermane which can deal a serious amount of damage, but of course, <laughs> it too takes that poison. And looking at the Pokemon that Chuso has in, his, in the back, uh, Rock is a really safe option into uh, all of them. None of them resist that. It just so happened that uh, Power Gem caught the Armor Rouge, which is a super effective hit uh, when it came in. Yeah, really, really nice catching with the Power Gem. Sludge Bomb would have done a little bit more damage to just a neutral hit, but catching the super effective with the Power Gem was very necessary there. Because if the Armor Rouge did survive, there was going to be an expanding force this turn, and that was massive damage. Even with the Assault Vest, Glamora probably is not taking that attack. So the fact that the Armor Rouge has been taken care of here Where's the offense into the Glamora now? Flutterman is still strong, but it's still a special attacker, and it's still going to have to contend with the Assault Vest on the Glamora that's also being helped by the Friend Guards. So uh, it really, might be quite tricky for Chuso now to break through this Glamora. Well, when in doubt, you terastalize, and uh, it's the flutter main for Chuzo, so it will be upping the power of its fairy type moves. Glimora, again, isn't going to mind too much about that, but the mouse hold, it might be a different story. So, uh, flutter main is now a pure fairy type. It goes for a big dazzling gleam, um, which the Glimora is going to be able to resist and takes that really well, especially with the assault vest and friend guard. But mouse hold does go down. Uh, Taran's lost those four, those little mice as a breaking swipe comes out from Roaring Moon and. Uh, Glamora does not mind taking that attack drop, but there it is. It's a second layer of Toxic Spikes, uh, meaning that any Pokemon in the back would be badly poisoned by that as a super effective Sludge Bomb comes out onto the Fluttermane. It's able to hang on just, but uh, that's not surviving another turn. No, definitely not. The fact that you went for the Terra there into the Ferry, turning that Sludge Bomb super effective, you probably needed it to get the KO on the Mouse Hold. It would have it been pretty close. You'd have still KO'd the Mouse Hold with a Breaking Swipe, but at least you turn the Breaking Swipe single target into the Glamora for extra damage. But then now the Fluttermane is on a timer of one. It will be KO'd at the end of this turn, even if it is not attacked. So, uh, yeah, really still fantastic position for Taran here. Great Tusk coming in. 
you can just go for a protect. Then you're not taking a Dazzling Gleam, the uh, Flutter Main would be taken care of, and then you've only got to contend with just the Indeedee in the back. And maybe the Royal Moon going for the Breaking Swipes would still hamper this Great Tusk just a little bit. Uh, probably won't be enough to KO the Glamora on this turn, you may need to go for Throat Chop, and that'll be quite close if Glamora is able to be KO'd there. But if you follow up with the Dazzling Gleam, then you're surely going to be able to pick up the KO. So Dazzling Gleam and Breaking Swipe would be a very good play for Shuso Hib to be able to take care of the Glamora while reducing the attack of the Great Tusk. But if you do attack this turn, and there's just to protect from the Great Tusk, you lose your Fluttermane, and that would be the best way of breaking through the Great Tusk. And in fact, we see the Fluttermane withdrawing for Chuzo in favor of the Indeedee that comes out again from the back. The Psychic Terrain is still on the field, so uh, it won't be resetting that as Great Tusk goes for a Protect, as Jamie was saying, keeping itself safe there. Uh, breaking Swipe coming out from the Roaring Moon, which will continue to chip away at the Glamora. Will it be enough for the knockout? No, it takes around uh, about half of the HP remaining from the Glamora there. Uh, as a sludge bomb, a big sludge bomb comes out from uh, Glamora. It's good damage into the Roaring Moon, not enough for the knockout. It does activate the berry, so Roaring Moon is able to heal back a little bit of health. But this Glamora is putting in so much work. Yeah, just the, the fact that the poison is just being able to be on the field the entire match. Mortal Spin was activated on that first turn, and then everything in the back was also poisoned. Mm. So the poison has just been really, really racking up at this point. And the Citrus Berry was necessary for that Roaring Moon to be able to survive through this turn, but it's still very much in range of just a couple of poison ticks again. At least the Breaking Swipe is now enough to be able to KO the Glamora, so if you do go for a Breaking Swipe this turn, you'll get the KO and also reduce the attack of the Great Tusk while breaking its Focus Sash. But it's probably still going to be in range of whatever attack the Great Tusk would go for if it goes on the offensive this turn. We see the Terror coming out from um, from Taran's side of the field, I believe, uh, on his Great Tusk, and it goes into the Ground Type. So all of its Ground Type moves will have a, an additional boost to their power, uh, becoming a pure Ground Type. As we see Helping Hand coming out from the Indeedy, um, which will bolster the power of Roaring Moon's next move, a Breaking Swipe, which is enough to break the Glimora or knock it out. Great Tusk eats up an attack drop, something it doesn't love to do, but even with the Helping Hand, it took that damage really quite well. Earthquake coming out from Great Tusk, which will connect into both of these Pokemon. The Roaring Moon taken care of. Indeed, he brought down to about a third a quarter of its HP, but of course it still has that poison to contend with. Yeah, and there's still nothing stopping just a Protect from the Great Tusk once again. Uh, the Fluttermate is forced in. There's no more switch outs. Two of Pokemon, two of Chuso's Pokemon have been taken care of. So now Fluttermane comes in, you Protect, and then you're able to just take care of the Indeedee afterwards with a headlong rush. So really, really strong showing for the poison from the Glamora here because you don't even need to go on the offensive to be able to take the KO, even if you want to. The Psychic Terrain's gone. You can just Extreme Speed the Fluttermane at this point if you do really want to, because uh, that is an option. You don't often get to an Extreme, extreme Speed of Fluttermane, so why not take the opportunity while you do have it available? But even if you didn't need to, even if the Fluttermane was able to KO the, the, the Dragonite this turn, you could have still just gone for the Protect with the Great Tusk, and the game was pretty much locked for Taran anyway. But yeah, style points to be able to get the Extreme Speed this would be Ghost. Chuzo is just a basic, is there any way I can eat this out? But uh, as you say, JB, uh, what a wonderful opportunity to go for an Extreme Speed into a Flutter Bay. And it just uh, sort of rubs salt in the wound a little bit for Chuzo, but uh, a, uh, an anecdote that uh, Taran can repeat as uh, Chuzo just trying to find a way if he can eat this out. But uh, it's, it's, it's not looking possible, quite frankly, as we see an Extreme Speed from Dragonite coming into that uh, Flutter Bay doing it, or what we were saying and taking it out, even though it's normally a ghost type and uh, this poor little indeedy left on the field <laughs> goes for a follow me and uh, it's going to be sealing the deal for itself there as it will be taking this headlong rush coming out from the great task and this is sealing up game one for perth regional champion taron birdie yeah absolutely and so that was actually technically something that chuso could have done to come back in the game there if the Indeedee was faster than the dragonites follow me and extreme speed have the same priority so if indeed did actually outspeed the dragonites that follow me would have activated and followed the extreme speed into itself. So then that just came down to the training of both Dragonite and the Indeedee. Mm -hmm. Both of them are very similar in speeds. Indeedee, you tend to run as slow as possible so that you can get the, uh, the terrain up and be able to make use of your own trick room if you're going mm -hmm. on the offensive. But Dragonites, there's maybe a little bit of a speed creep war between their mm -hmm. own Dragonites because obviously you want the fast Dragonite so you can extreme speed first. Mm -hmm. And that would have also come into play here in the fact that the Dragonite did outspeed the Indeedee. So indeed, naturally faster than Dragonite. You do need to actually train a little bit in Dragonite to be able to outspeed for sure. But indeed, may have been run slower than normal because you want to be able to make use of your trick room as well.
Absolutely, and Trip Room was not something that uh, Chuzo went for in that game. And I think going into game two, he'll be bearing in mind just how detrimental that debris was from the Glimora uh, yep. rock poison type. Mortal spins, toxic debris. You know, it's something that you think, oh, well, it's just a little bit of chip damage at the end of every turn. But uh, as he discovered to his cost, it really racks up. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm trying to, trying to find the best way of breaking through the Glamora on Chuso's team. It does seem like it's the Armourish. Mm. And if Armourish would have been positioned to be able to just go for an expanding force, then that would have taken care of the Glamora quite nicely. Because it's got the Life Orb. That's surely even going to break through the Assault Vest of the opposing Glamora. And if you do force a Terra, then that's not going to happen from any of the other Pokemon. We saw how strong the Headlong Rush was from and the Earthquakes from the Great Tusk when that had access to its Terra. So really making use of the Armourish has, has got to be the way to break through this, this Glamora. Although, actually, technically, Brute Bonnets. Brute Bonnets <laughs> yeah. doesn't want to take a Sludge Bomb, but it does have the Tech of Stomping Tantrum. Mm. Maybe that is for Glamoras. Like, even though you are, are going to be weak to the Sludge Bomb, you'll, you'll survive it. Mm. And then you, maybe you'll respond back with the Stomping Tantrum as well. It'll be really cool to see. It'll be... Uh Chuzo, going back to the drawing board here, it would be great to see the uh, Brute Bonnet coming out. Um, again, one of those Pokemon that's sort of uh, the Paradox Pokemon that doesn't see half as much usage as Fluttermane and I Bundle, but a Pokemon that is, is certainly respected uh, and definitely provides its niche. Uh, a version of Amoongus that can still spore, but also deal a significant amount of damage. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the main reasons you use Brute Bonnet over Amoongus. Amoongus has slightly better typing. Poison does better things for the Amoongus than the Dark does for the Brute Bonnet, but you do significantly more damage with the Brute Bonnets. Because Amoongus turns into pure support, Brute Bonnet can get the KOs itself. And apparently, it can get extra KOs that the normal Brute Bonnet wouldn't be able to get otherwise because of that Stomping Tantrum. And that could be that Glamora. It could, it could indeed. Glimora, of course, does not enjoy taking a Stomping Tantrum, it being doubly weak to ground-type moves. And we see Indeedee and Armourouge, that classic pairing coming out for Juzo, as it is the same lead for Taran in the Dragonite and the Glamora. Yeah, absolutely. And you want to make use of your expanding force in Psychic Terrain, but pairing the Dragonites with the Glamora is really, really smart from Taran because of its access to Ice Spinner. Because mm. you just get to go for Ice Spinner into whichever Pokemon. It doesn't really matter. If you go for it into the Ndidi, then it's guaranteed because it can't protect. But if you go for it into the Armourish as well, then you're forcing that if you are going for an Expanding Force this turn, then you are not going to be able to get it off. So, yeah, Ice Spinner going to be able to break the Psychic Terrain really, really nicely. And then your Glamora isn't going to take as much damage. But even if it's, it's even targeted, you have to choose which target you want for the single target Expanding Force. And then do you go after the, the Glamora so that you can guarantee the damage uh, into that as well? Do you go for the Dragonite so you can break the multi scale? Mm. Because assumedly the ice spinner is coming out and gonna break the psychic terrain and then expanding force really won't be as impactful as it could have been mm. uh, will Chuzo be predicting the ice spinner from the dragonite of course it's open team sheet but uh, we'll have to see as indeed he goes for a follow me uh, directing attention away from armor rouge and ice spinner instead goes into the indeed it was intended for the armor rouge but this will get rid of that psychic terrain just like that and uh, expanding force will be single target if it's opted for power gem coming out from glamora into the indeed which I believe again was intended for the Armour Rouge's super effective hit as it is an expanding force into Glamora now single target it survives on about a quarter of its health but at least it's down lower than it was at this point in game one yeah absolutely that's the damage you need and that also is a special attack that does not activate the toxic debris either so you still have to contend with any mortal spins that would be coming out but at least the Pokemon in the back would be somewhat safe from those poisons as well because you're only one move away from being able to take care of this Glamora now you'd just be able to go for another follow me and another expanding force we saw that that the damage based on just the single target non-terrain expanding force a one in psychic terrain would have surely been able to pick up the knockout so the ice spinner is incredibly necessary there to be able to take care of that psychic terrain to allow the glamora to still survive and do what it wants for this turn whether that is just going to be extra offense you know, coming out for it or just getting the poison onto either of these pokemon because you've still got the dragonite there with its multi-scale intact that's going to be pretty safe this turn Pretty safe indeed, and we see an earlier terror than in the previous game from uh, Chuzo going into his Armour Rouge, which, as we know, will become the Grass type. Uh, so it will no longer be uh, take super effective damage from any Power Gems that could be coming out from Glimora. Dragonite going for the Extreme Speed, good bit of chip damage. Armour is still on just above half of its health as indeed he goes for another follow me seeing that speed interaction as Jamie was talking about previously as a mortal spin comes out from uh, Glamour. Of course this is the problem you now make yourself weak to those poison type moves uh, in the case of the Armour being grass terror and uh, it's that status condition that I'm sure Chuzo is as sick of as his Pokemon probably are being poisoned. It's the poison type as the Glamour is taken care of 
on turn two. So the Pokemon that put in so much work for Taran on game one uh, is now out for the count. Yeah, it's still definitely put in the work, definitely mm. not as much as game one. Mm. But the fact that it's done so much damage and spread that poison on the Armourouge and the Indini, both of them are in the yellow, so they're going to be in range of really any attacks that we'll want to be going for here. With Great Tusk joining the fields, just Earthquake. Even though there's a grass typing on that Armourouge, the fact that Trick Room hasn't been set at all means that the Extreme Speed would go first from the opposing Dragonite as well to get that extra little bit of chip damage to guarantee that Armourouge would be in range of Earthquake. If you're expecting our Earthquake to still be enough to be able to KO the Armourouge, maybe you go for the Terra to be able to get that extra bit of damage. That means that would mean you would open yourself up to just go for the supportive Tailwinds that the Dragonite does have as well. So it just comes down to the confidence of how strong you rely on this Great Tusk to be able to pick up the KO on the Armourouge. There's no wide guard on it, so you don't need to worry about that. You can freely click Earthquake. That will KO the Indeedee. It's just, does it KO this Grass-type Armourouge? That will be the key thing, because if it does survive, you can set up Trick Room to counter an opposing Tailwind if that's set. You can just go for an Expanding Force and bring the Great Tusk down to its focus. Sash slash break the multi scale on the Dragonite as well. So it's all eyes on this uh, uh, this great task for this turn. It absolutely is. Indeed, he switches out. Not liking the look of this as uh, Chuzo switches instead. Aha, there it is, into the Brute Bonnet. And Tarrant doing what he can uh, in order to ensure the KO onto the Armor Rouge, going for the Ground Terror which will boost the power of the uh, oncoming Earthquake from the Great Tusk. Will it be enough to pick up the Armor Rouge? We will find out very shortly. Brute Bonnet is gonna, it's not gonna mind taking an Earthquake so much as Armor Rouge, in fact, keeps itself completely safe with a Protect. Uh, Great Tusk does go for that Earthquake, which is gonna go into the Brute Bonnet, boosted by the Ground Terror, but uh, because Brute Bonnet resists Earthquake being a grass type, it shouldn't mind too much about it. And uh, we see the damage done. Yeah, it's fairly minimal. It takes uh, maybe a sixth of its HP. Our Dragonite is indeed left free for the Tailwind. It's sat on the field since the beginning of the game, and it's providing a good amount of use. Yeah, absolutely. But you are going to be out outspeeding both of these Pokemon regardless, so the Tailwind not coming into play too much. It may in the back if there's a Fluttermane or Roaring Moon for Chuso, but at the moment the Tailwinds didn't really have any impact on the board state at the moment. The main thing is that the Terror was committed to the Great Tusk. That means you can no longer go for the Terror with the Dragonite, and you can't go for a super effective Terror Blast into the opposing Brute Bonnet. That means it might be able to survive this turn and should be able to get off either a Spore or a Bullet Seed. Uh, Bullet Seed would be able to break through the Focus Ash of the Great Tusk and be able to potentially pick up the KO if it gets all those five hits. Four might not be enough. Five would be very close to be able to, be able to pick up the KO. But now you have to rely on the Ice Spinner once again from the Dragon Knight. You do like to be going for that into the Indeedy to break the Psychic Terrain, but it's not going to be as strong as a Terra, Terra, Terra Blast with the Flying Typing would have been. So this Brute Bonnet might survive through this turn unless you go for a close combat into the opposing Brute Bonnet. Instead, we see the uh, instead we see uh, the Elmeru switch out for the Indeedy coming back and setting up that Psychic Terrain again. And it is a close combat from the Great Tusk into Brute Bonnet, and that goes straight down as Great Tusk eats up a defense drop to its physical and its special defense. So, unfortunately, the Brute Bonnet wasn't able to provide a great deal this match for Chuzo, as we see Ice Spinner coming out from Dragonite, as indeed he switched in, so it immediately gets rid of that terrain, as well as the Indeedy, and uh, it's Armor Rouge and one more in the back for Chuzo. Yeah, absolutely, and the Armor Rouge is still poisoned as well, so it is on that timer, and it is re really low health as well. So whatever comes in really needs to be able to carry the weight for the rest of Chuzo for this game, because Armor is there, yeah, it's still in the red, so two more poisons will be able to KO. It's also in, in range of extreme speed that can be gone for because that Psychic Terrain was taken care of on the Switch as well. It does seem like it is Flutter Main. That's probably the best choice to have in the back to try and take on the Dragonite and the Great Tusk, but you have to contend with the fact that Great Tusk is going to be doing so much damage with its Ground Terror as well, and the Armor Rouge should be in range of extreme speed. So you can just go for that attack into the Armor Rouge, not worry about the Flutter Main. In fact, you've still got the Tailwind, so actually the Tailwind even though it still didn't seem like it was too impactful in the first couple of turns, it's going to come into play here if you did just want to go for an Ice Spinner instead to guarantee that the KO is going to be happening on the Armourage because that would be super effective as well. And then that means that the Great Tusk is still outspeeding the, the uh, Fluttermane this turn, and that's going to be able to do some massive damage and KO that as well. It's a really good example of knowing when to go for something like a Tailwind, even if it might not benefit you right now, just thinking ahead a few turns what might in the end game. And we see Dragonite going for extreme speed onto Armourage. It's able to pick up the knockout, and now it's Fluttermane against the world in the form of Taran's uh, remaining three Pokemon. Uh, Great Tusk going for a headlong rush into that Fluttermane, and it's a big damage, a lot of attack, and it's enough for the one-hit knockout. So a fairly clean win in two straight sets there for Taran Birdie. Yeah, absolutely. Being able to make use of that
that Glamora really, really well. So effective in that game one and still effective in the game two. But that's all it needed to be because the other Pokemon waiting in the back were also very good. We saw how effective the Dragonite was at dealing with opposing Indeedees. That's one of the main reasons you're using the Dragonites to be able to get rid of that Psychic Terrain. Because Ice Spinner, you don't fit it onto too many Pokemon. Dragonite is one of the main ones you do. So you are able to break that Psychic Terrain. That frees up the Glamora. We saw it able to survive a Life Orb Expanding Force, which it definitely would not have been able to do if the Psychic Terrain was still on the field. So really, really nice synergy between Taran's Pokemon. Yeah, it's fantastic to see. MVP of Game 1, of course, Glamora. MVP of Game 2 has to be that Dragonite. And uh, what a powerful pairing it is as well into the composition that uh, Chuzo brought along. And, uh, you know, Ice Spinner, it's a move that often feels like it doesn't quite do the damage that you would like it to. But it just, uh, Taran there going to show just how impactful it can be when you're facing something like an Indeedee. Yeah, you do tend to run Ice Spinner as utility, even though it's actually really good damage. Yeah. And like previous physical Ice move, we had to contend with basically Ice Punch, which is Ice Spinner is actually stronger, and Icicle Crash is only a tiny bit stronger. So the fact that we're saying that Ice Spinner doesn't really do the damage, probably should, mm. but you're always using it to get rid of the Psychic Terrain. That's its main use. That's the main reason why you've got it on your team and why you run Dragonites in the first place. So you run Dragonite to get that extra massive damage with Terra Blast and things, priority extreme speed, but Ice Spinner is also a very big thing for it. Very big indeed, and uh, Ice Spinner, of course, is also a 100% uh, accurate move, um, which it cannot be said for Icicle Crash, and it's a, it's a good, reliable option, and the fact that it has that secondary effect as well as Indeedy Armor Rouge uh, continues to be a, a dominant presence in uh, Regulation B games, um, it's, it's, a, it's a really useful move to have. Yeah, absolutely, and, and so is Mortal Spin. Mm. Mortal Spin putting in a lot of work there, just everything getting poisons. Like we, we're seeing that pick yeah. up. We are like, yeah. it seemed like no one was using Mortal Spin, and then we saw Yuki Zananovic over in OCIC running Mortal Spin with spikes and this very supportive Glamour. And, and I think, like me, myself included, is like, is that really how you're supposed to run Glamour? Mm. Surely you're running the offense. Everyone's running the offense. Mm. And then we all decided, yes, Mortal Spin, <laughs> poison's good. Extra damage, extra residual damage is very good. And a perfect showing over that in the game one. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's amazing how Glamour has sort of redefine VGC not only in terms of setting entry hazards but also in terms of the poison type and the poison status condition. It's not something that was ever that useful in VGC before uh, because of how quick the games are, but uh, it just goes to show how that damage can rack up, especially against something like a Dondozo. Yeah, well, the main poison type that players would run is Amoongus, mm. and that spores things. So yeah. That doesn't toxic things. It can toxic things. It doesn't. Mm. So it spores things instead. So, yeah, the, the poison condition, maybe you'll get a sludge one poison here or there. Mm. That's about it. Yeah. But yes, now now a lot of things are being open to the fact that you can get the mortal spin, you can get the toxic debris, and that is just really, really chipping away at things. It de definitely does remind me of the, the Colossals and the Charizards back with the just residual damage. We saw how impactful that was in the previous generation, and it seems like Glamora is that version in this generation. You can't Gigantamax in this generation, and uh, we've come full circle, coming back to our favorite Gigantamax Blastoise with those cannonades, but uh, we can't go for those anymore. Instead, Glamora is filling that niche for us. My goodness, we've done a lot of advertising for Glamora uh, just in the past game and uh, if you're tempted to give it a go then by all means we've seen how well it can be piloted by someone like Taran. I'd be interested to see if Glamora will adapt even further. Have we found mm. the correct move, the move set for it? Assault mm. Vest is very strong. It's able to make use of that very well because there's so many offensive moves you want to make use of. You have to drop one of them. Like the, fa the fact that you, you want Power Gem and Sludge Bomb you want that offensive coverage from your same type attacks. Mm. And then you want coverage of Earth Power to hit Steel types. You want Energy Ball to be able to tear into the grass most effectively because then you get some massive damage there. But you do want Mortal Spin. Mm. It seems like we definitely want Mortal Spins on our Glamoras. So, mm. yeah, that is it's interesting to see that Glamora has been adapted so much. And can it be adapted further? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it seems like a firm favorite for Taran. We'll have to see how good it remains. Uh, going forward, and especially into Regulation C, uh, it's, it's something that can deal good damage to Wo Chien, being a uh, grass type. And uh, otherwise, we'll have to see how it fares up against these abilities that drop uh, Pokemon stats. Yeah, well, you've got Chi Yu. That gets yep. power gems. And you've got an Assault Vest to somewhat patch up the, the Beads of Ruin drops. So, yeah, it seems like Glamora actually will still be it looks like it will still be effective. Just mm. as contained with Tinglu. Yeah. And the fact that it can still go for the super effective ground type attacks. But but yeah, otherwise it seems like yeah, Power Gem into, into Wo Chen, uh, not Wo Chen, uh, Sludge Bomb into Wo Chen and Power Gem into uh, Chi Yu and the Chen Pao as well. Mm. Gamora seems like it's going to be pretty well positioned. So even the fact that it's so strong at the moment, 
it might stay as strong. Yeah, so there you go. We started this match with talking about how strong Chi Yu seems to be. And we've ended this match by talking about how uh, powerful Glamora could be into it. There's a potential counter. There are plenty of others as well. But uh, it'll be fascinating to see going into regulation. See uh, how uh, the usage of these Pokemon continues to uh, stack up. But what would you have liked to have seen from uh, Chuzo Jemmy uh, to adapt to Taran's team? I think that he almost had it. Mm. If the Armourage got into Tailwind and got in safely, then that would have been the position, because then he would have been able to launch off the Psychic Expanding Force. I think that's the big thing. If there was going to be a Psychic Terrain Expanding Force, that would have been much more impactful in that game. We mm. saw that the single target Expanding Force wasn't enough. It was mm. good damage, wasn't enough. So it needed to be the Psychic Terrain Expanding Force. If you're going for the Trick Room route, you just Ice Spinner. Turn one, taken care of. Then yeah. you have to reposition, switch back out, and all, the, all this stuff with the Ndidi. So then it's a little bit awkward. Getting the Tailwind up, would have been very good. So the fact that there was a power gem, power gem into that slot rather than the sludge bomb, which would have been the strongest neutral damage against everything, very good call to catch that armor rouge because oh, yeah. then it was able to take care of that. That would have been the big thing. Psychic Terrain Expanding Force could have changed that game. It really could. Uh, and it, again, a, a masterclass on how to sort of position yourself around that threat because, of course, Glimora takes super effective damage from Psychic-type moves. And uh, there were two Psychic-type Pokemon on Chuzo's side of the field. So just a, an expert display in how to pilot a team. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd like to hear more from the man himself that was able to win that game. Uh, so we are going to cut over to an interview with the winner, Taran Birdie. Welcome, trainers. We are here, of course, with Taran. How are you? How are you feeling? Feeling pretty good. Feeling pretty good after yeah, that. Yeah. Um, it was uh, it's a tricky one uh, yeah, with was. the trick from and the win, but it went all right in the end. So. Yeah, it felt. Uh, I, it seemed to go pretty well for you uh, that match. I feel like the Glimora did a lot of oh, the work. It was there. really good. Yeah, I um, only added it to the team a few days, actually a couple of days ago, but. Um, I brought it a lot today, uh, more than I expected, so really happy that it's going well. Yeah, and it's because Mortal Spin, just a nice uh, support yeah. move, hit, being able to hit both opponents is like what the main yeah. plan behind that. It's great, yeah, Mortal Spin to you know, get a bit of poison for my attackers in the back, but it's also got really good coverage, and with Friend Guard and Assault Vest, it's really hard to knock out, and you saw in that game against Trick Room, it's really good for just stalling turns, which I need to do to get my Great Tusk in at the end. Yeah, because with the mouse hold, uh, you kind of want to force it that well. Those special moves don't activate its ability. But yeah. So that they have to hit it physically with yeah, the assault vest as well. Yeah. So it is a bit tough cooking it's, to yeah, go through. Yeah, it's really hard to break for some teams, and yeah. especially without any poison types, you can just lead it, mortal spin, get some toxic spikes up in your. It's a well, very yeah. good situation. And uh, the Dragonite as well, been putting in work as well with the Ice Spinner, yeah. trying to make sure to get rid of the terrain. Yeah, absolutely. And that's uh, one of the leads I go to against Trick Room all the time now, is uh, get rid of the terrain. It makes um, it makes Glimora, you know, yeah. it, has, it has a better time on the field. It's not getting hit by the Psychic Terrain Expanding Forces, just regular ones. I can. I can take those all right. Yeah, and we've seen, we, have, terror, yeah. we have seen that in the game. Yeah. It was quite spectacular to see. Yeah. I take it that well. Yeah. Uh, so, like making the team, what you only recently decided on it, and like. So I used the same team for the Perth Regional Championships a couple of weeks ago, yeah. and there was not enough time to really change it. But I noticed that I had Torpol in that slot before, and I played I mean 22 games in Perth, and I brought it once, and it won the game I brought it to, but it wasn't. Um, it wasn't coming enough to justify it, so I tried a load of Pokemon in that slot and settled on Glamora because it helped in some matchups. Yeah. And uh, you're happy with the change yourself? Like oh yeah, I'm happy now. Happy now, clearly. It's been doing well. <laughs> it's, it's been, been doing, doing very well. I played another trick from earlier as well that Glamora did a lot of work Oh, so in. previous matches you also like won all the trick room and uh, yeah, anything I've... else particular that you faced off? Um, another one was just like one of those Tailwind teams with Talonflame, but they, they'd mixed them um, Marcus's and Wolf's team with the Iron Juggler and the Goldengo yeah. with the standard Talonflame Great Tusk stuff. Um, okay, yeah. So it was interesting to deal with, but you know, once again, Glamora came to one of those games and it didn't die. That's amazing yeah. to hear. So Glamora really being the main key factor now it's within a team? More so than I expected. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how long that's going to last, but for the moment it's been doing well. It's been putting in work. Do you, th do you feel for uh, the next regulation, Regulation C, do you think that uh, Glamora might make a return there? Or? Almost certain, yeah. We've seen in some of the grassroots tournaments that uh, Glamora and Wochien, like that kind of stall team, has been doing quite well. 
that terrifies me and that's not something I want to look at but at least Gamora is doing well and I will definitely be looking at it. Yeah exactly. exactly. We have seen, uh, we ha actually have seen uh, a bit earlier on stream we have seen a Dodozo with the uh, Glamora as well. Yeah, which is that's like the standard way you see Glamora. I don't like Don Dozo and I liked my team. I just wanted something there that yeah. could waste a bit of time really. And I mean, your team great. has been looking pretty clean as well. It's just looking very nice. You have, of course, Iron Battle and Fluttermane still one of the most commonly used Pokemon. Yeah. And you bring those often enough as well. Yeah, so Fluttermane comes to most games. It didn't come to this set, interestingly, but, you know, once again in Perth, I brought it every single game I played. Same with Great Tusk. I think Great Tusk is really the key of the team. It's just so strong. Um, with Sash, it's hard to knock out as well, easily. And, yeah, I love Great Tusk. Great yeah. Tusk is my favorite. That's completely fair. And, like, future-wise, because you have been to Perth, of course, mm. like, are there any events that you are seeing into the future that you might join as well? Um, so EUIC, for sure. Um, that's going to be really exciting, given it's so massive. That's true. Um, Turin, the Turin special event as well, I that's want to go to just because I love Italy. Yeah. Um, and then, potentially, NAIC. Um, if I get a travel award or a side bend, I'll probably go, but... Yeah. Undecided, yeah. So, still possibly a lot of events to be able to yeah, join. Still to, quite a few, to, to yeah, still see you at. And uh, so, yeah, lo looking at Perth, because that is quite a proud moment for you yourself. Mm. Was that your proudest mo moment, or do you have something else that no, you No, I think that is the proudest moment, because, yeah. you know, for a while now, especially last year, I went into a lot of tournaments believing that, you know, I had what it takes to win a tournament that everything needs to go right. And you never go in like expecting it to be you. So when it finally was, I didn't quite believe that, that it got all the way. So yeah, that must I was feel great. really happy with that. Yeah, that must feel great. And yeah, before that tournament, I'd never won a top cut yeah. match. So um, to win three on in one day was pretty nice. Yeah, that's very good. Do you have, like, have any advice? Because like a lot of people are probably in that position mm. as well, where they feel like maybe I'm not good enough. But yeah. do you have like something? I think it, you just have to keep practicing and keep playing um, and it all pays off eventually Yeah. Uh, if you practice well and enough and also just realize that a bad tournament isn't going to be the end of everything. Yeah. Uh, I went, you know, at one point two years without getting championship points in a, a regional and you just have to like keep going and like yeah. don't get demotivated um, and it will, it will pay off eventually. It will pay off eventually. Yeah. That is a beautiful way to see that. and. Well, we have to look a bit more in the future because now with regulation be almost over. Are you gonna miss it? Are you gonna miss? It's been good for me so far. I, you know, I want to rejoin it. I got day two at OCIC. I've really enjoyed it. Um, but I'm excited for the Ruin Pokemon. I've always been a believer that in Scarlet and Violet, at least the first format we've had of it this first year, yeah. that we should be playing with all of the Pokemon. So I'm finally happy that we get to play with all of them. And we're actually getting and back to that. But yeah. it's been good to um, have these short series because Pokemon like Meowth, Garada or Goldengo, we might not have realized we're this good if we had the ruin Pokemon just invalidate nice. them from the start. So I'm happy that we're finally at Regulation C. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad, you know, the way we've got there, and I'm really excited. Do you it. have a, an eye on a certain uh, Runus Pokemon, personally? Oh, I think Ting Lu's, Ting Lu? Ting Lu's one of my favorite. It's just impossible to knock out. It, it is, which is quite a bulky yeah. Pokemon, and it's looking very nice as well. So, yeah, we have been talking uh, regularly, you see, so that means EUIC, of course. Do you, uh, so you still need to prep for that as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm uh, waiting for some of the regionals to happen in a couple of weeks' time to get some ideas because it's really close, and I have not played nearly as much as I uh, would hope. Yeah, but that's, that's just how it goes with these series, right? That is very just much prepare true. for the next tournament that comes. Is there anyone you would like to shout out or, like, uh, like that helped you maybe with the team a bit um, more? Or? Okay, so... Calvin Foster, uh, he's not here today, but we worked on the team before Perth Regionals. Yeah. Uh, he's not here today, but I decided it was good enough to keep using. Yeah. Also, Baz, uh, Baz, he was on stream earlier uh, using the same team. Unfortunately, he lost, but yeah, I spoke with him a fair bit over the last couple of days, yeah. just deciding on that final slot. Um, yeah, that's about it for the team. Uh, right. I, I often don't build with many others, uh, no. just because I'm always switching around with teams. Never know what I really like until very close to the tournament. It's very close, yeah. yeah. Got to decide last minute. So yeah, like, pretty much. Right, this is what I want to yeah. play now. <laughs> so, 
Yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, I hope you are enjoying your stay here, of course. Thank you. Yeah, I've never been to the Netherlands before, so it's uh, yeah. I'm enjoying it so far. Uh, yeah. I'm happy to hear that. Uh, hopefully, more tournaments here to come, and you can yeah, visit a bit absolutely. more as well. Yeah. Uh, and with that, we do have our interview here as well. Uh, after this, we have our round five. Uh, thank you very much for joining. It was very nice to, uh, to be able to talk with you, uh, and we will see you guys in a minute as well.